Caesar, and um, I made this song in support of uh, Bonds v Gannick, uh, Gardening Question Time. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Peace. <laughs> Yeah, yo. I be bored under the money trees, kind of a rapper, but really only give a off about the flowers growing next to me. Letters to celery lessons and letters were well, letting the veg grow. Sunstorms hail blow, but still I'm here digging up potatoes in my big old brown coat. It's locked down, so all these harvests come in handy and it's healthy to be grafting on some ground that's really asking for tomatoes. I might smoke a mile, bro, or sprout an avocado. It really takes its time so slow. Yo, it really takes its time so slow. Practice my patience or space on the part the plants in the plot. I'm raking all these leaves which biodegrade into good, good soil. Hey yo, soil where I choose to toil. I don't support the walls for stolen oil, temper boils. I don't support having poison covering food and royals richer than everyone else or CEOs who never loyal to no one but the door. Yeah, to no one but the door. So I'm sticking to my homegrown from sticky icky to chili, zucchini, and spinach. I never won't. No. Yeah, man. It's all about this allotment business, you get me? You want like 60 pounds for a whole year, man. And I'm like, I bring home these fat stacks of, 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 you know, kale and perpetual spinach and all that. Do you know what I mean? What do you know about organic food? You don't know nothing about that, man. And it, yo, honestly, bro, just try it, man. Love, you know what I mean? Support allotments, bro. The allotment act, then, whatever year it was, was a very important act in the UK history, uh, right up there with the Ramblers Act, right? Hello. It can be a bit confusing sometimes when trying to buy veganic produce. For example, I live near a vegan supermarket and they sell a lot of fruit and vegetables and it's all organic. However, people are shocked when I inform them that most of it's been grown with slaughterhouse byproducts such as fish, blood, bone and manure. There are some veganic produce in the shop uh, grown by local vegan farmers, but this produce isn't labelled as such. The same goes for vegan products, which are labelled as vegan and organic. This is no guarantee that they've been grown in a vegan way. The big vegan companies who are able to buy their nuts and pulses by the shipload are in the position, with the help of the Vegan Organic Network, to encourage farmers to transition to a plant-based way of growing their food. One day, when this happens, the likes of you and me will be able to go into a supermarket and buy a vegan, veganic, cruelty-free nut or bean milk. Welcome to Veganic Gardener's Question Time, episode three. I'm Dan Graham, and I'll be your host for today. In today's show, we hope to bring you some new ideas and inspiration, however big your garden or windowsill may be, we're here to help you grow. We've had a bundle of questions sent in. Um, so, and we've got a we've got a brand, well, we've got a couple of guys from the first show on again, and we've got a new member to our panel. So I'd like to introduce to you. Oh, <laughs> she's not. <laughs> I think Jenny's got something wrong with her internet at the moment. So I will internet, introduce you to Piers Warren. Piers Warren, Hi. author of, um, here we go. Should I click on my one here? And here's his book. Oh, just getting these controls. Oh, there we go, we got it. Hi Piers, how you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Good, 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 good. So, yeah, Piers, you've, uh, you've obviously you've written a, a, a number of books, um, but also you're the founder of Wild Eye, an international filmmaking school. Um, can you tell us any more about that? 
Yes, that, that's been running for um, 20 years now, and we do a, a variety of courses for people who want to become wildlife filmmakers or people who are just starting on, on their career ladder. So they're, they're short specialist courses, um, uh, mostly done in the UK, but in the past we've, we've done quite a few overseas trips as well. So over the years, we've had at least 2,000 students through our doors, many of whom have gone on to become professional wildlife uh, filmmakers who go on to make programs like Spring Watch, which is starting tonight at 8pm, BBC Two. Brilliant, brilliant. Wow, wow. And you must have done some uh, interesting wildlife filmmaking yourself. Yes, it's it's running the school has taken me all over the world. So I, I have, in the course of it, ended up filming sharks in the Bahamas and lions in Africa and tigers in India and uh, uh, a lot of very exciting uh, animals. So it, it's been an experience, yes. Great. All right. Well, nice one, Pierce. Good to hear about what, what you're doing. Um, and we've got, oh, Jenny has, has arrived. So let's say goodbye to Piers from now. And we'll say, hi, Jenny. Hi, hi. How are you doing? Good. I'm glad you made it. Just just in yeah. the nick of time. Yeah, I've had to go on my mobile data because the broadband wasn't up to it. So sorry about that. All right. Well, at least you're here. Great. Well, you're looking well. So, so we've got you. Jenny. So we've got Jenny Hall from uh, Climate Friendly Foods, veganic farmer for over 20 years. And she is the co-author of, whoops, Growing Green, co-author with Ian Tolhurst, which I think was the first edition 2002? Uh, 2005 it was finished, yeah. So the, the, the standards were 2002, I think, or around about that time. So, so what, what inspired you to write the book and put the standards together? Or explain, can you explain what the, what the standards mean? Yeah, I mean, well, I think um, there was a disconnect. I mean, there was a disconnect for me, actually. I started working on an organic farm that was using animal manure. And uh, so so when I found David, uh, obviously the founder of Vaughn, it was like a, an epiphany for me that somebody else was thinking the same. And then it was a matter of sort of trying to professionalise that and um, create a set of standards, which wasn't an easy process. It was quite a long process because um, vegans have lots of different views about what farming should look like. Um, and um, so, yeah, but, but I wrote the book for myself, really, because I was starting at zero and I wanted to put everything that I'd sort of come across into one place because at that point there was nothing you know you could get little bits here and there I remember spending a week in Aberystwyth University because I just really could not find the information so it was really a starting point for somebody who wanted to start professionally growing. Great well I know, I know the book's been very well received and I think we're on to the fourth edi uh, fourth edition now so yeah well thanks very much for for putting it together I think I think people refer to it as the as the bible the veganic bible <laughs> oh thank you well you know what I've had such lovely comments over the years and and it's made me and it still feels um even now it still feels relevant and perhaps it was a little bit ahead of its time um but yeah it's, it's, it's a very comprehensive it's not an easy read I mean that's the thing it's like something that even I dip in and out of it because I forget the spacings and things like that you know so it's a, a very useful sort of encyclopedic guide Cool. So I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I was going to ask you, what, what do you think of the current um, agricultural bill? Oh, yeah. Um, well, interestingly, it could be a really positive thing for vegans. Um, the idea behind public money for public goods. Um, this is talking about things like restoring wildlife, rewilding, forestry, woodlands, all the things, um, particularly on marginal land where you can't grow crops. Um, that I think vegans would like to see in the countryside. I think the reality of it is that it's going to mean a massive income cut for farmers, even though the uh, sort of stewardship element, which is called ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Systems, is um, more generous than its predecessor. But because the basic payment system is being removed, I think farmers could see a massive uh, cutting income, DEFRA is talking about getting farmers to retire. So I, the truthful fact is I'm not sure whether it will impact on crop, crops 
I'm, I'm a bit worried that it'll lead to further intensification. We're already seeing that they that they're not expecting the same standards for imports as they would for British growers. So my my gut instinct is that some of it bits are good, but I think on the whole, it's 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 not towards a sort of health healthful agricultural system as you know towards plant based diets. Whether some of those things happen on their own back, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see. I can't. I can't predict everything, but I would say that, um, you know, I think farmers are in for big upheaval. Right. Well, thanks for that, Jenny. Well, we won't go on too long. We could be here all night on that topic. Maybe we need a special <laughs> programme to uh, cover it. OK, so um, we also, let's have a look. We also have Matthew Appleby, super veganic gardener or super organic gardener. We've got his book here. That way, there we go. Super organic gardener, Matthew Appleby. How are you doing, Matthew? I'm oh, good, thanks, Dan. Good to see you. Good. Any what's happening on the allotment? What's happening? It's going crazy. Everything's going head high, which is just how I like it. Proper jungle. Great. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Well, we're going to get straight on with the first question because we've uh, and we'll get everybody up on the screen. So we've got Jenny. We've got Piers. Um, let's stick it in this oh that's the mode and our first question is a live question coming from cherry and i think it's a hi cherry can you hear us all right we need to unmute cherry's mic there we go okay hi um yes um my question is this uh we have a mature fruiting cherry tree which is um maybe 20 years old um, it's always given us a great harvest of masses of cherries, but in the past um, two to three years, um, I've noticed that um, maybe only a fifth of the flowers are getting pollinated, um, which is obviously, I think, due to the lack of insects. So I want to ask the panel um, if they can suggest um, things I can grow, um, which will attract more insects into the garden around that time, which is about um, early April, I think. So um, other than that, um, might there be any other, another issue that I've not thought of? Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll start off with this one. So um, one first thought is that not all cherry trees are self-fertile. So do you know whether yours is or not? And do you have any other cherry trees in the garden? Um, there are no other cherry trees. Um, well, there are some cherries nearby, actually. Yes, um, okay. but this one, this one, when it's had a good year, you know, it has been really good. Um, mm. And this year, it's, this is just behind me, but um, this year, I've no definitely f far fewer of the flowers have been pollinated and um, developing into cherries. Okay. Well, let, let's assume it's. Um, due to a lack of insects, and, and we all know that insects are, are in decline. It seems that it's been quite sort of sudden two or three years ago from what you're saying. One possibility is that maybe nearby um, somebody kept bees uh, in hives in their garden and maybe they stopped doing that a few years ago. So that's one possibility. Right. But in any case, the, the, the thing we want to concentrate on is, as you say, putting other plants in the garden that will attract pollinators, bees and other pollinators um, mm -hmm. to your garden. So they're more likely to find your, your cherry tree. And uh, of course, we're talking about early spring. So yes. you'll be looking at things like um, primulas, grape hyacinths, uh, crocus, right. mahonia, um, Bluebells, even I know that in in the in the woods, bluebells tend not to flower until May. But actually, garden varieties of bluebells will um, flower earlier, and that may well coincide with your tree. The other right, thing okay. you could do, of course, is you could plant another little cherry tree in your garden. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even need to be a big one. It could be just one in a pot somewhere, right, okay. Okay. and of course, that will flower at the same time and. Uh, yeah bring the pollinators in so there's certainly yes quite a lot of of nice plants that you can plant around to attract more insects right. in uh, in april 
Right, okay. Might it be um, a general problem that there are just far fewer insects, um, you know, the insect population has diminished anyway? Is that yes. an indication of? It, it could well be, yes. But as I say, there may be a couple of other things going on as well. But but in general, we're all seeing a decline in uh, pollination by flying insects. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, please. Great. Great answer. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the question, Cherry. Bye. Okay. Great. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Let's have a look. Get everyone back on the screen. Okay, and now we're ready for the next question. Let's see if this all works. Here we go. Here we go. From Chris in Bolton. Let's have a look. I live in Bolton and want to know which variety of fruit trees the, pa the panel recommends to grow in my area of the country. Anyone want to tackle that one? Jenny? Oh, you seem to be muted. Sorry, yes, I'm happy to, to tackle that one. Partly because I used to work in Bolton um, and I um, our farm is near Wigan, which is next to Bolton, so I sort of know the Northwest. And, um, you know, with, with the Northwest, we're in the rain shadow of the Pennines and particularly Bolton, I mean, obviously I can't know what soil it's got, but I would suspect it's quite a heavy, heavy clay, um, which most of the soils that I've known in Bolton have been. So I think um, there's there's sort of three three fruit trees that jump to mind that are sort of like almost like bankers or if they've been in my experience, um, you know, that'll take wet, horrible weather, which is, is plums, gauges and cooking apples. Um, I think... So it's possible to have a go at growing um, dessert apples. We um, we grow quite a lot of dessert apples at the farm, and we took the advice of Martin Crawford. And the, the key thing is looking for canker resistance. If we've got canker resistance, then we, you know, but it's also important to go and have a taste of those apples beforehand. So, for example, in the northwest, there is um, a Cumbrian apple society that have an apple show every year and you can go and taste the apples so i think it's worth doing that before plumbing to buy but the ones that we found have been absolutely fine um early so beautiful bath gladstone woolbrook pippin cornish aromatic katie and sansaparel they're all advice of mike crawford he also recommended london pippin but we we grew it and i, I don't rate it really um and also the other apples that I think are quite good are ones that are sold by um, Walcock Nurseries, the um, organic nursery. And, you know, we've had success with Spartan and Saturn, Ellison Orange and Ribston Pippin. And they're all really lovely, lovely tasting apples. I think pears are very good for damp conditions as well um, and just stand for ones like a conference or commerce. And finally, I think really any, you know, if, I think the thing with berry fruit, you've just got a like be committed to picking it um, and rhubarb as well. So yeah, I think those are pretty, you know, you go with whatever's available. But um, I think the key thing is looking for things with damp resistance, the canker resistance, particularly in dessert apples. Brilliant, pretty comprehensive uh, answer, answer oh, there. Dan, Dan, I was gonna say as well, if anybody wants it, I'd be quite happy to share. I've got a spreadsheet with all our, our apple varieties on it. so. If somebody wanted to have that, that I'd, I'd be more than happy to share that. Great. Well, just email uh, events at veganorganic.net and uh, if you want any advice on your, your apple, we'll send over Jenny's spreadsheet. Cool. Have you guys got anything to add to that? <laughs> You're pretty comprehensive. Okay, let's let's go for the um, next next question. Here we go. We've got a question back from Angela. What type of hedging would the panel recommend for an allotment? I would like something for wildlife and to shelter plants from the wind. Who's going to go for that one? Any takers? Yeah, that. Okie dokie. Okay, right. Well, I think it's probably, um, because it's allotment, you want something which is going to fruit, um, which is going to produce something. I remember my, my brother wanted to build a hedge in his, next to his new build house and he 
said, I'm going to plant a row of Leilandi. And I said, don't do it. And he did it. Don't do that. Um, because it will grow massive and it will take loads of maintenance and it will attract no wildlife. So um, you want something with berries and nuts. So hazel, blackthorn, rose hips, uh, crabapple, quince, blackberry. You might not get the densest hedge with that. So you might not get um, as much shelter to begin with. But you definitely want to plant a variety of things and not just one thing, um, because otherwise you just got a, a monoculture and you haven't really added anything. Um, there's also the idea if you're planting a nut tree, you could plant trouble underneath the roots and you can get another crop out of that as well. Um, so that's uh, quite a few ideas about what, about what to do there. But um, having listened to Jenny, I bet she's got some better ideas than me. Jenny, you got any good ideas? No, no, I, I really like what um, I, I like what um, Matt said. Uh, the one thing we found that's worked quite well is uh, Eliagnus, um, which have these sort of like glittery berries on, and they're also a nitrogen fixer. But they just grow absolutely whopping. And um, we, we we grew um, hazels. That hazels are better in a hedge than stand, you know, standalone plant. And uh, so, but yeah. No, I, I thought it was really good. In fact, I've been thinking of doing something like that, Matt. So thanks for that. I was, I was actually taking notes as you spoke. So, uh, you know, I think I think the idea of a forager's hedge is, is a really, really positive one. It's something that, that's a talking point as well. You know, I think it's nice to do that. But I mean, traditional hedging with um, water as well is, you know, putting money supple through it, that kind of thing is, you know, I think it, it depends on your motivation, doesn't it? If, if your motivation is to do um, foraging or if you just want to sort of like have flowers in there, you know, the roses are really nice, aren't they? Running through it as well, you know. But yeah, it all, it all sounds good. Great. Um, I, I could just add a couple of things, which is um, Matt's absolutely spot on about having a, a variety of plants, which will be best for the wildlife. Um, but in addition, you could weave in um, a few evergreens as well that are really good for wildlife and being evergreen they will also provide more shelter throughout the, the colder windier winter months um, so examples like and again these are all, all natives um, like holly and ivy if you can dot them about in the hedge as well they'll be great for wildlife ivy is fantastic um, for uh, the winter wildlife and both the flowers and the fruits so um yeah recommend that as well excellent great brilliant let's go on to the next question from let's get the there we go um where is it um, here we go jackie a question from jackie until now i have gardened quite happily living alongside the bowls planting a few extra for them this year whoops this year, however, you are eating more than we are, and, I, and all I'm left with is the tops of the onions and the fennel. If they start on my rhubarb that I've been nurturing all winter, I think I might cry. Ah, oh, is there anything I can do, Jackie? <laughs> um, yes, I'll kick off with that one. So, yes, this is a, a typical dilemma, but of course we want to uh, attract wildlife into our gardens and often it's the case that the, the wildlife will provide good services for us like like predating on things like slugs that we may not want so many of. Um, voles uh, can get out of control though in terms of they can attack, a, a, attack the plants that you want like the ones that you've mentioned and also they're very keen on peas and beans and voles don't hibernate so they'll be around right throughout the year and the thing about voles is that they don't like open ground they like cover so they live in the long grass and hedges and wood piles so the first thing that you can do is around the beds where you're growing the particularly susceptible plants is to clear a space around the edge of them uh, so that the voles don't have cover right up to the plants they want to protect and it doesn't have to be much e even one foot or 30 centimeters of clear space around the bed can be enough to deter the voles who don't want to run out over into that 
open space where they are then vulnerable to owls and other predators uh, like that. So that's the first thing I try is to is to make this space. Um, if you do have something like a wood pile, which they're maybe using a, as shelter or a home, maybe try moving that just to another part of the, of the garden, a wilder part. Um, if, if that doesn't seem to work, there is another thing you can do, which is dig a trench around the bed. Again, 30 centimetres wide, 30 centimetres deep, and the voles would really not like to um, climb down and cross that. However, of course, that is, um, it's, it's not an, a, a practical thing to do when you're coming and going to the bed yourself. It can be a bit of a health and safety hazard if you're constantly falling or tripping over the, the trench itself. But I'd, I'd start off by trying to clear that space and uh, see if that deters them coming across. Excellent. 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 Anybody got anything else they want to book? I get this so it works. Oh, there we go. I might add that um, foxes are predators of voles. So you could try and get more foxes in your garden. And cats are predators of voles as well. Um, so of a semi-natural predator, obviously, they're domesticated. But as Pierce says, move stuff around in your garden and voles don't like change. So that would upset them. Great. Thanks, guys. Nice one. Let's go on to the next question. Let's see if we can get this to work. Add to the screen. Whoops, it works. How does the panel import fertility to their farms, wood-based compost, etc.? And do they think that these methods are sustainable if employed wildly, uh, widely? Anybody want to take that one up? Jenny's got a hand in the air. Starter for 10. Jenny? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think I think this is sort of quite a fundamental question in uh, veganics of you know where does the fertility come from? So if I just start with what we do on our five uh, acres, is that we've got well, we've got two two kind of systems really. We've got uh, annual beds and then we've got uh, perennials like orchards and forest gardens. So let me start with the perennials. So perennials is that we can we grow nitrogen fixing plants so the eliagnus the nitrogen fixing gorse and broom are nitrogen fixing uh, siberian pea shrub is nitrogen fixing though i don't really rate it if i'm being very honest and then um we always put to the north of our trees we, we grow an italian alder this is a, a, a technique recommended by martin Crawford. and it, it's it's a really good one and also it changes the the shape of the um the sort of tree canopy. I mean, our, our forest garden is quite young at this moment, but, but in time that will be sort of quite an important factor. If we look at annual cropping, I think this is quite a fundamental question. So we are like virtually, um, we do all our own fertility with the exception that we buy in propagation compost. And I think if I did put my mind to it, we probably could, you know, avoid doing that, but um, it's, it's, it's a time issue. So our uh, fertility comes from growing green manures, predominantly red clover or white clover. And then in the winter before it's ploughed in the next year, we um, apply it, um, we apply wood chip compost. And it, and actually this wood chip compost is grown on the farm as well. So it, it's, it's, it's willow, willow poles that are put through a shredder. Willow is easier because it's straight. You can use other hedge cuttings, but they're quite hard to, and um, put through the shredding like blackthorn, you know, you have to have thick gloves on and everything. Um, I think it's perfectly feasible if you are rural to be virtually <laughs> self-sufficient in uh, fertility. I think the difference comes when you become more urban or peri-urban in that I think that then it's, it's, it is, um, I think it's absolutely valid that that fertility can come from the re recycling of uh, society's waste and actually you know that is a, a perfectly sustainable way to do that so i think it depends on where it's coming from if you're recycling society's waste there becomes issues around uh, contamination and you know uh, are these you know and, and transport because organic materials really bulky and can be really difficult to transport but i think there's ways that it can be done well i think the recycling of garden waste actually is is is, is good one that often um landscape contractors struggle to know what to do with it and they don't want to landfill it. So having somewhere that that can be recycled into the soil 
I know from Ian Tolhurst's experiences of using wood chip compost, he's actually doubled his earthworm population in, in quite a relatively short space of time. And if you think about it in terms of um, compared to ordinary compost, it's so much more stable carbon. It's, it's a really important part of boosting soil carbon. So I think uh, sort of wood chip is here to stay. I think it's really important for, for soil health, but it has to be applied to green manures. We're not applying wood chip compost to bare soil um, for fear of nitrogen lockup. And I think, you know, th those things combined with the use of nitrogen fixed in green manures. We're just in the northwest, so I said red clover and white clover because we're not favourable, but if you're sort of further south, then uh, in the UK, then things like lucerne and sampoin uh, would also be really suitable nitrogen fixtures. So, but yeah, I think I think both, but if it's a rural farm or a peri-urban uh, peri farm, I think, you, you know, you should be moving towards the majority of your own fertility. Cool. Very comprehensive, Jenny. Great answer. Anybody got anything to add for that? Um, I've got an urban allotment and we get horse manure and wood chip delivered and the wood chip comes from tree surgeon. I don't know, I'm not sure, you know, precise origins, but I barrel that on top of the green manures and it serves as a manure, as a compost and a, and a mulch. And, you know, I find that very effective. Um, and obviously I make my own compost too. And, and that's in a sort of urban environment. But, you know, we're quite lucky to have that brought straight to the allotment. But as Jenny says, you know, professional gardeners have got tons of waste they produce. So if you can get them to bring it to your place, then that's a good idea. And uh, on a garden scale, um, I'm a big fan of uh, making teas out of uh, nettles and comfrey. And uh, I do this every year and I rotate it. So it, it, it takes about two weeks to make a tea out of a bucket of nettles. So every two weeks I, I make this, strain it, and then start off a new bucket. And that's great for uh, diluting and then watering, um, watering any plants, particularly in pots and greenhouses and places like that. It's a very good way of, of adding nitrogen and fertility rapidly to plants as they're growing vigorously at this time of year. Great. Anything, any more comments? <laughs> yeah, I, I was just, I was just, I was just going to add to the, um, to sort of the liquid feed thing that it's really important that you don't apply anything sort of potash rich to young plants. And it's just because I've seen this being done um, because basically when, when it's, if it's very rich in potash, um, particularly I'm talking about fruit and plants like tomatoes, it's actually signaling for them to fruit, but it's also, I've also seen it sort of cause um, sort of nutrient lockup to very young, I'm talking about very, you know, when they're really young and little. Um, so it, it's, it's, it, there's a timing issue as well, isn't there, Piers? Yeah, that's right. So uh, generally I, I start with a, a nettle feed, which, which is nitrogen rich and it encourages the growth of the leaves. And I save the comfrey feed, which is higher in potash until later in the season when the plants are already fruiting and then they can use that, that feed to um, grow bigger fruits. Excellent. Okay, I think we're ready for the next question. Let's have a look. Maybe we're going to add it to the stream. Here we go. Question from Sharon. My question is, I have been given four tomato plants but have no greenhouse. Would they survive in pots outside? I'm putting them in a shed each night at the moment, but obviously I won't be able to do that once they get bigger. They're against a south facing wall, but I live in South Wales, so not sure if the climate will be okay for them with all our rain and chilly nights. Let's have a look. Anybody got any ideas on that one? Uh, yeah, we've got that one, yeah. Um, they'll be fine now. <clears throat> Interestingly, in May, there was two big frosts the week before last. And uh, Christmas tree grower got in touch with me and said, basically all 5 to 10% of our Christmas trees will be no good for Christmas now because the ends have been frosted because we had 
um, the rain, then we had the warm, and then suddenly we had really late frost, which has created a kind of month window. But we're over that now. So I think in England and Wales, um, you'll be fine to keep tomatoes out now. Any tender plants can, can go out now because we're very hopefully 99% past, past frosts. But obviously you can cover tomatoes in some sort of like plastic grow house. If you do put them in a greenhouse, which um, this, the um, person with the question hasn't got, you're gonna have more problems with the pests anyway. So it's a more natural environment outside. So um, yeah, I'd say stick them out and um, you'll be fine. Right. Let's have a look. Here we go. Anybody else want to add anything to that? Um, I could just add that, of, of course, there are some varieties of tomato that will be better suited to growing outdoors than others. So do have a research about varieties for that. Two, two in particular that I grow every year. One is called Tumbling Tom, which is uh, a, a kind of bush tomato. You, you, you don't pinch out the side shoots, so it grows into a domed bush, really good for growing in a pot in a sheltered place. And it, it, it grows tiny little uh, tomatoes the size of marbles, which are really good in salads and pasta dishes. The other one is a larger tomato called, called Marmonde, which is M-A-R-M-A-N-D-E. And uh, that grows good sized tomatoes. Uh, again, you can do it in a, grow it in a large pot and they're particularly uh, successful when grown outdoors. And I'm, I'm in West Wales too right near the coast. So if I can do it, you can do it too. Great. Thanks, guys. OK, let's, let's go on to the next question. Let's have a look Add to the stream. We've got a question from Becky in X Essex. I'm hoping to join the event live, but that depends on how quickly my little boy goes to sleep. I did have a question, though. I have a mulberry tree in the garden one of the reasons we got the house. However, it's getting quite large. When is a good time to prune it? Also, one of the branches is supported by a Y-shaped crook. Not sure if that's a technical term. Is there anything else I should do to support it? Are there any other considerations I should know? I want to ensure that the tree is well cared for, Becky. Uh, okay, well, I can talk about mulberries for a bit. So um, they're quite unusual trees in that they do tend to grow wider than they grow taller. So, for example, a, a large mulberry tree might be as much as eight metres tall, but 10 metres wide. So it has this very big spread of lateral branches, which can get heavy as they're older, which is why commonly you do see these big branches supported by y-shaped crooks so in terms of pruning you you don't often need to do a lot of pruning with mulberries um, and the time to do it is definitely when it's uh, uh, in complete dormancy so i would recommend pruning in december and first of all you want to look for the the three d's which are common when you're pruning any sort of tree or shrub so anything that's dead or diseased or damaged are the first things to prune out. Then also look and see if you've got any branches that are crossing over and rubbing each other, then prune either one of those out or both of those out. Um, if you have very long lateral limbs that are getting the way, you can reduce them. Um, other than that, I would keep an eye on these long, heavy lateral branches and if any do look like they may be in danger of splitting where they join the main trunk, then um, you may need to get some more of these supports. So yes, generally the Y-shaped support is, is very common. And if they're made out of wood um, or, or metal, for example, just put some Hessian sacking in between the support and the branch so that it, it, it doesn't rub and uh, cause any wounds there. Other than that, mulberries will pretty much look after themselves. Um, they'll certainly benefit from a mulch of compost in the spring as nearly every plant will. So um, yes, have a go at your pruning in December. Cool. Any other advice for the mulberry tree? <laughs> 
Okay, well, I think we've got time for one more question. It's quite a long question, this last one. So uh, here we go. We'll get it up on screen if we can. Um, I'll get it on my computer. Oh, here we go from Steve Shaw, Krishna Eco Farm in Les Mahago. I think it's near Glasgow. I volunteer a community farm project with a small holding of a few acres. We don't use any chemicals, fertilizers, nor fish, blood, bone, but we do use cow dung from a neighboring farm. We supply free vegan fields, meals from local vegetables to homeless and low income people in Glasgow. Well, hey, I'm trying to turn a grass field that was formerly used for grazing cows into arable production for vegetables. We don't have a tractor nor a plow, but we do have a rotavator and a trimmer and lots of old carpets. The ground is hard and clayey and hasn't been plowed before and the rotavator is not strong enough to go through it, especially with the soft stringy couch grass roots. So I've covered a big patch with carpets and black plastic to weaken the grass. I'd like to grow potatoes there next year. I will uncover it in the autumn and rotivate it, at which point I'd like to sow a green manure. But my question is, da -da -da -da, will I be able to trim it and rotivate it in? I need a green manure that doesn't have stringy roots and that will help to break up and loosen the soil, please. My question is to ask which green manure would be best for me, please. Steve. Well, hey. Who reckons on that one? Jenny's got a hand up. Here we go. Um, there's a lot in this question, actually. So I thought I'd just try and cover all of it before answering the green manure question, if that's okay. Um, so for me, the general rule, my general rule of thumb is that we try and turn our fertility in in spring just before we need it. So um, the sort of covering of the grass in autumn, I can understand the reasons for that. I suspect the carpet will not do a brilliant job with the cooch. Um, cooch, is, it, it's, uh, cooch is such a master really of survival. I mean, I've had plastic down before and, and dug it up and the cooch is still there after four years, for example. It tends to oh. run actually, it, it, it gives, it, 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 it keeps going. So I wonder if um, the, the, the carpet is good for sort of getting the greenery down, but I'm, I'm worried that if we go with the rotavator onto cooch, um, all we're going to do is chop it into little bits and propagate it. I wonder if part of the issue might be that it, it depends how big, because if, 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 if the intention is to say, for example, do all of the field, then it may be worth considering getting a contractor in. If this was for me, I would get a contractor in to come and plough it next spring. The ploughing in spring, so we have a cooch burden on our land, um, partly because I just don't have the time to weed it enough. But, you know, having the dry weather has been such a, a good thing for hitting it. And also the, the, the initial ploughing doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't chop it up into small pieces. And then we have it um, harrowed with a straight line harrow at the and again, the advantage of a straight line harrow is it's not chopping it up into small pieces. In fact, if anything, it sort of pulls it up and brings it to the surface. So, um, yeah, I think I, th I don't think this is an easy answer. I, I wondered if Steve might want to get in contact with me after this, um, because I think it's really what the long term intentions are, because if the long term intentions are that we want, you know, to farm this at scale, then I think, you know, there's going to be quite a, a battle ahead, I guess, to get on top of the cooch. And cooch is a, you know, cooch can, you know, to go to rack and ruin. Rack is the um, actual colloquial name for cooch, uh, you know, and it has ruined farmers in the past. I mean, this is not to, to make people feel bad. But uh, the other thing that I've found through experience is that um, starting small is better. And being small on a, a small piece of land and being successful on small, even if you've got access to more land, is better for confidence. So maybe it's a matter of actually physically hand digging it. Perhaps Steve wouldn't like that answer. Going back to his question about a green manure, I think, um, well, there's several green manures that, um, that can be killed by winter frost. So an example of that would be buckwheat 
or Cecilia um, if you're further north. Sometimes Cecilia will survive if you have a very, very mild winter. Um, traditionally, mustard was grown before potatoes. And the reason mustard is grown before potatoes is that it reduces the wireworm population. There's a problem with mustard in that it is a brassica, so it can infringe the idea of having four years between brassicas. Um, buckwheat's a good one because it, it does do a really, really good cover the previous spring, but I think you probably wouldn't have time to sow it. If you wanted to sow a late um, green manure, like October time, the only thing really you which would work at that time is some form of cereal. So something like cereal rye or that, and, and that would turn in relatively easy, but there can be an element of lockup if you turn it in when it's already started to go golden and yellow, you know, it needs to turn it in when it's greener if you want it to sort of be nitrogen fresh. But, um, and then I think, you know, as I said in, in at the start is that we have a cooch burden and we found it easier to grow crops that grow out with their leaves. So things like kales, and this would suit the uh, idea of, of growing for meals as well because you harvest over time. So all three kales, Red Russian, Calvinero, and um, uh, you know just traditional green curly kale. Spinach beet is good for this. Uh, chard is, is good for this, and also salad leaves. So it might fit in really well with growing for meals because you harvest these things over time. And when you harvest over time, you tend to be more on it with the weeding as well, you know, because you're going over crops and you know a lot of a lot of weed things is you know the physical looking at plants rather than it ending up in a corner and sort of getting forgotten. So yeah, it's, it, I didn't give a straight a, an easy answer. There isn't an easy answer to this question. Um, and uh, hopefully, but as I say, if Steve wanted to contact me outside of this, I, I could have a chat with him on the phone. Great, thanks Jenny. Thank you very much. Anybody, guys, you got anything to add to that? No. <laughs> well, it's been a great show. Thanks a lot, everybody. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it on a different screen mode now. There we go, everyone's still on the screen. Here's is hidden a little bit by the banner in the corner. So, yeah, just like to say, yeah, today's show has been brought to you by the Vegan Organic Network, an educational charity, the only UK organisation solely dedicated to veganic farming and growing. We do produce a magazine. There we go. Tony, you like to see this. Growing Green International. There we go. If you sign up, become a member. I think you can become a member for as little as £13 for a year. Wow. That's uh, just about a pound a month. Um, or there's different prices, but um, we do have another event coming up in a couple of weeks, and we're going to be hearing the story of Cheyenne, the veganic farm come circus. So it's, yeah, a circus and a veganic farm. So they're down in Cornwall, and they're going to be joining us and telling us their story and about all the activities they've got, being, they've got going on in their farm. Um, so I'd just like to say thanks for watching, but don't go away because we've got a great song just coming up here from uh, from Maka B. Um, so, and it's got a little end screen. We're giving you lots of useful information. Let's see if we can get this to work. Here we go. So, here we go. So, yeah, goodbye from everybody. We can all wave goodbye. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye.